Today I'm going to be talking about um, the World Wide Telescope. Um, earlier this week, um, we, we put together a uh, World Wide Telescope uh, planning task force for the AAS to ask the question whether the World Wide Telescope, which I will talk about in some detail shortly, um, uh, would make sense to be at home at the AAS. Um, and there was a council vote, um, and it came up positive, and so uh, World Wide Telescope is going to be um, at the AAS um, for at least the next few years. Um, and um, therefore, it's going to be a really important resource for the AAS journals. And so I'm going to talk to you uh, both about what the World Wide Telescope is. Um, hint, it's not a telescope, just like the thesaurus is not a thesaurus in the technical, in the sense that I think of the word thesaurus. So, anyway, um, and the uh, virtual observatory isn't an observatory, et cetera, et cetera. But so uh, the World Wide Telescope um, is really cool, though, even if it's not a telescope. Um, and I'll just be telling you, I think, really cool ways where we're going to start to try to incorporate it into our journals. All of this is future tech um, at some level, but um, we really want to get your ideas about um, how a tool like this could become really useful. Um, mostly I'm going to be just showing a bunch of videos because it's lunchtime, and right? Um, so you'll get a sense for what the World Wide Telescope is and, uh, and how we can use it in the journals. So get started, I'm going to give you a little introduction from uh, my home institution, Space Telescope Science Institute. Oh, before I do that. Um, Papers are no longer made of paper. Um, and in fact, they're made of all sorts of other cool stuff. Uh, we put together this thing called the paper of the future, which is if you type paper into the, of the future into the internet, you'll find it. And it has a lot of um, just sort of cool ideas of things that could be incorporated um, into, um, uh, into our publications. And Gus has already uh, made a bunch of progress doing some of these things. Um, but one of them that we mentioned is, is including the World Wide Telescope. And I'll show you um, what I mean. So here's what the World Wide Telescope is, at least to get started. See if this works. Tell me if it's too quiet or too loud. Hi, I'm Frank Summers of the Space Telescope Science Institute, and I'm here to tell you what we do with Worldwide Telescope. So, Worldwide Telescope is this great software for exploring the night sky. And one of the great things about it is that it has image collections in it. And if I click on here, I can show you that we have hundreds of Hubble images inside the software. And one can tap on one of these images and the software will pan across the night sky and then zoom in to that image. Now, let me reorient this using some on-screen controls. Great. Now, we can zoom in on this and continue to zoom in and continue to zoom in because Hubble's highest resolution images are inside this software. The Microsoft Worldwide Telescope folks took our images and created tiled resolution images so that they can download the pixels as they're needed as you zoom in. So we can pan across at full resolution through this image of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And one of the things I like to do with people is that we, I like to show them that this is what Hubble sees but that is what the Digitized Sky Survey sees. Hubble, ground-based. Hubble, there can be no question as to why Hubble's resolution is so valuable to astronomy. We can also pull back and use this not to just look at visible light images, but we also have a Spitzer image of the Whirlpool in here, and I can go from the Hubble image to the Spitzer image to the Hubble image, to the Spitzer image, and back to the Hubble image. All right, and this shows you a wonderful way to compare multi-wavelength astronomy. So we've got bunches and bunches of Hubble images in there that people can explore. One of the other things that I really like are the guided tours. There are guided tours across all sorts of astronomical subjects inside WWT. And for launch, I created a tour on Hubble's view of the Orion Nebula. So that file was very quickly downloaded, and the tour starts. And this is just my intro to it. There is sound uh, narration as well as soundtrack uh, included in this tour. Since we're doing it going up, uh, again, it pans across the sky and starts on Orion. I'm going to pause it and show you what these tours look like in detail. They really are a collection of slides. It looks very much like a PowerPoint talk, 
but this is a power point of the night sky. So, for example, I can go to this slide here, double tap, we get to that one, and I can pick up the tour from there. Now in this slide, you can see that I've got some graphics overlays of some circles, as well as some moving graphics of the uh, arrows showing how the hot stars are creating the bubble of the nebula. You'll also notice that I put the text as an overlay um, for the hearing impaired on the, um, on the slide. And anything you can do in the interface, such as zooming into an image, can be done within these tours. All right, let me pause that here. So these tours are great because, well, people don't have an astronomer handy. You don't have a friendly neighborhood astronomer to tell you all about the night sky. Experts can create these tours right, and teach you about astronomy. It's the next best thing to having a planetarium on your computer. The other thing is that teachers love these tours because they can get their students to create them. Creating them is very easy. It's just a little bit more complicated than creating PowerPoint. And teachers love it because it encompasses STEM education. You have the science of astronomy, where they go out and they research the topic. You have the technology of using the computer program, and they can then share their tours. They can create and publish their tours just simply by sharing a WTT file, which is uh, the Worldwide Telescope Tour file. It's very easy to share. They can create communities within the, within the software and then share their files amongst everybody there. So we found it is a wonderful way for exploring Hubble images, but it's also a great way for students to teach themselves self-directed learning. So those are just a few of the ways that we use Worldwide Telescope here at STSCI. Um, <clears throat> so you get the sense of Worldwide Telescope. It has, um, uh, you can think of sort of two major capabilities just for the present, for what we're talking about right now. One is this tour authoring idea. We can move around in space and you can tell stories that go sequentially. Um, you can add all sorts of overlays and text. Um, you can add movies. You can add your own data of, of all sorts of different kinds. Um, and then there's this sort of seeing um, images in, in context, right? He was showing switching between a Hubble image and a Spitzer image, a DSS image and a, and a Hubble image um, to show data in a particular location, um, but not sort of inside this tour. Um, the, at present, the authoring environment for the tours is, is a, a, a desktop application for Microsoft, but there is a web environment um, that's being even more fully developed where you can look at all these things. So these things are all sort of web accessible. All the stuff that was shown there you can see in, in the web. Um, which I think is really going to be useful for us. And so historically, at least till now, a lot of what Worldwide Telescope has been used to do is what he was talking about. Um, outreach, communication, um, communicating um, uh, concepts to students, um, having graduate students work with younger students and so forth. But I'm going to show you a couple of ways where I think um, we're going to be able to use Worldwide Telescope for the AA's journals, which may be helpful for authors. So I'm going to skip this one. Um, I'll skip that too, actually. Um, just wanted to give you a sort of a sense of scale of the sort of people who are using this right now um, and what's been happening over the last sort of five to 10 years of development in Worldwide Telescope. Um, lots and lots of people um, are using it, um, millions of users here. Um, and then there's, there's lots of um, uh, publications that are referencing it and so forth. So you get this sort of sense of scope. And I just wanted to give you that as well. Um, but I want to focus on three things that I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to be pushing forward um, at AAS Journals um, that will incorporate Worldwide Telescope. So the most clear one that I think is going to be extremely powerful for authors and is going to be very low cost um, to generate is this Images in Context. So this is a, a Barnard's image of uh, Ophiuchus. And if I click on it, there's just a simple web URL link, something you can, of course, include in a PDF or any kind of digital document um, we generate. Um, and what it'll do is launch a web browser without assuming I'm connected to the web. Um, we'll open up Worldwide Telescope. We'll slew over to the source. We'll zoom in. And we'll put the data right there in context. And this allows you to look at this in the context of existing data sets. So this is the DSS. Um, but there are many, many, many background data sets that you can look at and compare. 
Um, and then you can also import other data and compare to that data. So often, right, you're looking at um, some little piece of a galaxy in somebody's, um, propose, in somebody's uh, uh, manuscript, and it's very hard to tell um, exactly where they're looking. And you can look at the RA deck, and you get out your ruler, and you're like, is my thing in their thing? Or is the part that I'm looking at the same as the part that they're looking at? This makes this really, really easy with a single click. Um, I think this is the kind of thing we'll be able to implement really um, efficiently. We don't have a time frame yet, um, but I'm really excited about this as a, uh, a tool. Um, for our journals. Um, sort of more for our future is thinking about um, orphan data repositories. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the journals community um, and um, in AAS in general about what we do about data that comes from telescopes that doesn't have a repository associated with it. You know, we're very lucky at MAST. Um, you know, Hubble has its own repository. Great. And we have lots of developers that can build these beautiful front ends. Um, uh, I, I work at MAST, so, you know. Um, but the same thing is true of um, ESA. They have this thing called ESA Sky. Um, but what these things are based on is essentially a worldwide telescope-like view of uh, the universe uh, where your data sits on top of that. And you can sort of see, oh, well, this is the footprint of my data. Here's where my data sit. Um, uh, hope, and something we haven't done yet, but something we're excited about, is using worldwide telescope. So if you include your data with your paper, the hope is that we would take that, we would put it in a, a repository, and then worldwide telescope could be the front end. And this has already been done. Um, with some data that uh, Alyssa Goodman was using in her complete survey. So you can see the footprints of her data on top of the Worldwide Telescope view. Um, so this is something hopefully to look forward to in the future. If it's something you're interested in, please come talk to me. Um, come talk to all of us. It's something we're really excited about. Um, and then something that's already happening is video abstracts. So I'm going to play you this little video by um, Thane Curry and then uh, maybe another one by, uh, well, you'll see. So I utilize the capabilities of the Worldwide Telescope as a part of the video abstract for my recently published paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. And this is a paper that reported the first discovery of a new object with the next generation of dedicated exoplanet and planet-forming disk imaging instruments, so-called extreme adaptive optics. And WWT played in a very important role. Uh, I think, in communicating our science results. Specifically, I helped to make my publication far more accessible and conveyed information far better through images and video, you know, than I could probably communicate through words. The video utilized began with a simulation of the orbits of the solar system planets, coinciding with our team's effort to cast our discovery with sort of the, the general context of the solar system's uh, architecture. And really the impressive aspect of the video above all else was how it visually transitioned from this context to the specific target of our paper. And this is a star called HD 115600. And it showed an all sky map of the region surrounding the star, zoomed in to focus just on the star, and then superposed, superimposed our discovery image of this star surrounded by this beautiful Kuiper belt like debris ring. For getting excitement built for his paper. Um, you know, this, of course, doesn't lend itself to every conceivable paper if you have a paper on numerical turbulence, maybe there's not such an obvious way to use Worldwide Telescope, um, but many papers, of course, you know, look at objects on the sky. Here's another one that I really love uh, by Doug Roberts, who's, I think, in the audience. Um, at large scales, the center of the galaxy hosts a massive stellar bulge and many giant molecular clouds. The intervening gas and dust obscures the optical view, but radio observations reveal complex emission dominated by Sagittarius A, which contains many components including a young stellar population centered on a strong radio point source, Sagittarius A star, which coincides with a 4 million solar mass black hole. We present radio images within 30 arc seconds of Sag A star based on recent VLA observations at 34 gigahertz with 7.8 microjansky sensitivity and a resolution of about 88 by 46 milliarc seconds. We report 44 partially resolved compact sources clustered in two regions in the eastern arm of ionized gas that orbits Sag A star. These sources have size scales ranging from about 400 to 1600 astronomical units and a bow shock appearance facing the direction of Sag A star. Unlike the bow shock sources previously identified in the near IR but associated with massive stars, these 34 gigahertz sources do not appear to have near infrared counterparts at 3.8 microns. We interpret these sources as a candidate population of photoevaporative protoplanetary disks, or proplids. They're associated with newly formed low mass stars with mass loss rates about 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 6 solar masses per year and are located at the edge of a molecular cloud 
outlined by ionized gas. The discs are externally illuminated by strong Lyman continuum radiation from about 100 OB and wolf Rayet massive stars distributed within 10 arc seconds of Sag A star. The presence of propylids implies current in situ star formation activity near Sag A star and opens a window for the first time to study low mass star, planetary, and brown dwarf formations near a supermassive black hole. How that's just a very powerful tool for giving you context. Uh, at least for me, I've worked in the Galactic Center um, before, but understanding, oh yeah, there's that arm and it's inside that and it's over there, that's what he's talking about. Um, it's very powerful and the hope is that in the future, this will be a, uh, a thing you can stop in the middle. So it won't just be a YouTube video, you can view it in the web um, and it will move around and if you wanna stop and look at that and then overlay your own data on it, you'll be able to do that inside this, inside this video. Um, so if you're interested more in the double, uh, WWT and how it relates to AAS, there's a, a booth for the WWT ambassadors. Space Telescope has a huge working version of it you can play with, um, a number of posters. And then at Hack Day on Friday, um, we're going to be trying some cool new stuff with it, I hope. Um, so if you're excited, um, come say hi. So I think I'll leave it there and take some questions. Thank you.